This is Tom Bain. And this is Wine, Money, and Song. If you find the content of this channel of interest, please subscribe. And if you have like-minded friends who are interested in wine, please tell them about it. And in comments, please let us know what subjects you would like us to cover and if there's wines you want us to react to. Wine fallacies. Many people think that there are strictly written rules in enjoying wine. Now, a lot of them have been accumulated over uh, centuries. So I want to dispel some of the uh, wine fallacies and uh, folklore that has grown up in the wine industry. First is, certain countries make the best wines. Let's say the French produce the best wines in the world. Now. They produce some of the great wines in the world, there's no doubt. But if you talk to people in Italy, I think they might have a different feeling about it. And you talk to the people in Napa Valley, they might have a different opinion of that. So it's very subjective what best is. And understand that. Understand that no one makes the best wine. You decide yourself what you like the best. And believe it or not, your taste will change over time. That's first wine fallacy. Second is about oak barrels. Now, oak barrels, supposedly, you use new oak barrels and you're gonna have a better wine. Now, I know in California that I've had wine growers tell me that whenever they use oak barrels for the Chardonnay, it adds about 10 to $15 more per bottle because the oak barrels cost so much. Now, why do you use oak barrels? Certain wines, it, it gives subtle flavors of vanilla, uh, and also the oak barrels are toasted a, a certain degree to impart certain flavors. And it, the oak barrels give an opportunity for the wine to age and absorb certain flavors from the barrels. But does it make it better? Now, if you use too much of anything, it's going to be predominant. Have you ever had a, uh, a dish that had too much curry in it and it just overwhelms the food? Well, if you use too much new oak in a wine, it can overwhelm the wine. So fallacy two, not true. Doesn't necessarily make a better wine. Okay, third fallacy is cork finish wines you have a cork in the bottle, are better than screw top wines. All right? Not true. Not true. Now, do cork screwed uh, screw cap wines, they don't have a proven history of aging. You know, that's still, that's still going on. But 98% of all the wines that are produced are not meant to be aged. So you would think... 19 out of uh, 20 wines can have uh, screw caps on them. Now, I'm, I'm used to buying wines that have corks in it, all right? So, but generally, 98% of the wines could be served with a screw cap. And if you don't need to age the wine more than two or three years, a screw cap doesn't matter. It's much easier, much easier to do. Fourth fallacy. When you go to a restaurant, they pull the cork out, they hand you the cork, and they want you to smell the cork. <laughs> Smells like a cork. Why, why do they do that? Now, a lot of restaurants don't do that anymore, but the reason why you smell a cork, you're trying to smell if there's any mold or mildew uh, in the cork, and if it is, there's a chance that it has passed through the cork and into the wine. But why smell the cork? Taste the wine. Now, I popped the cork uh, of a young Rioja the other night, and the cork really stunk of mildew, really stunk. And I says, oh, we're gonna have a problem. I poured the Rioja in a, decan in a decanter, poured it, perfect, no problem. So smelling the cork, it's really weird. Smell of the cork, you don't have to do that. Smell the wine. Okay, here's a big one. Certain wines need certain glasses. 
Now, I have people who swear they buy $150 wine glasses and it makes the wine taste better. I'm gonna, I'm gonna knock that down. It's the opening of the glass that's the important thing. Certain wines need more surface to be exposed to the air to get the aromatics out. Let me show you some wine glasses. This is a sherry glass. Now, in my life, I think I've used this once or twice, all right? It's a sherry glass, and you could put port in it too. Very small, you could do liqueur in this too. Very small amounts. Then we have a champagne flute. Now, controversial now, controversial, because you can see the bubbles, and you can see the stream, and it fits nice in the nose, and it's neat, but there's not a lot of room here, and if you're having a full body champagne, I'd rather have something wider so you can get the aromatics out of the wine. This is what I consider to be a white wine glass, especially good for Riesling, Sauvignon Blanc, light-bodied wines, and easy to drink, nice and comfortable in the hand. Uh, so I use this for all-purpose white wines, but not full-bodied white wines, light-bodied white wines. And here it is my all-purpose glass. It's kind of in between. So you could serve light body red wines, light to medium bodied white wines. Uh, and generally I use this 60% of the time. Uh, and it feels comfortable in my hand, which is important for a wine glass to be comfortable in your hand. Next we have a Bordeaux glass. Bordeaux glass has a lot of, has a lot of surface and you swirl it around and you can get the aromatics out of the Bordeaux and the wine changes as it's open so this affords a wine good oxygen level exposure and you get the full nose of the wine. Then we have the big glass which is a burgundy glass but can also be used for Nebbiolo which means Barbaresco, Barolo, uh, and maybe some Tuscan wines, I don't know. I would rather, I would rather use uh, other glasses for, Tuxin, uh, for Tuscany wines. But this is a burgundy glass, very big. Uh, they're big glasses. They can fit, this is like 15 ounces or so. And, and you really don't want to fill it up for 15 ounces because it's heavy on your hand and, and it's tiresome to lift up and down. So those are the glasses. Okay. Once you, and another fallacy, red wines should be served at room temperature. Now, what's room temperature? Depends on the house. But generally red wines, full body red wines, I'd say about 65 to 70, or 65 to 67 degrees, like Chateau Neuf de Pop, really big wines, uh, uh, Southern Rhone wines, uh, some of the bigger ones from Italy, uh, Napa Valley, uh, Cabernet, Mountain Cabernets especially. But if you're having lighter bodied red wines, they should be served about 60 degrees. And Beaujolais, which is made of Gamay, uh, even cooler. So what do you do to cool them down? You don't chill red wines, you cool them down. Difference, okay? Chilling is making them cold cooling them down, you pop them in for a half an hour in the refrigerator, 45 minutes, and it cools them down to get to the proper temperature. Once you open a bottle of wine, this is the next wine fallacy, all right? You open it up and you only drink a glass or two. Now this is a white wine and you could put the top back on, put it back in the refrigerator and it'll last a week or so before going downhill. But if it's a red wine, uh, you drink two glasses, what you should do is have a bottle like this. And it's a half bottle. You open the bottle knowing you're going to drink a glass or two. Open it up. Fill it up to the top. And then put a top in it. This is a glass stopper. It's not a cork. And I find that very handy and very aesthetically pleasing. 
So you don't have to pin, and that'll last for weeks, sometimes a month or two, just depending on the wine. So you don't have to finish the wine. You could store it and have it later. Another fallacy, red wines should be crystal clear. They should be crystal clear. And that is not true. There are many wines that are made very naturally and they're not fine or heavily filtered. So there's a natural sediment that's in the wine. Now the wine won't be clear, but when you put it down, the sediment will go down to the bottom and be careful not to pour the sediment. The one thing a wine should not be is cloudy. Having sediment and natural deposit, it's different than cloudy. Cloudy is a bad sign that there's something wrong with the wine, all right? Sediment, a little particulars there that are natural are fine. Let it settle. But if a wine's cloudy, I would expect you might have a problem. And here's the biggest fallacy is oh, you pay more money for a wine. The more expensive a wine is, the better the wine is. Not true. Not true. Now, you pay a lot of wine, you expect, you pay $10 for wine, you pay $100 for wine, you expect it to be a better wine. Is it 10 times better wine? No, generally not, generally not. You pay high premiums in wine for very slight differing, differing characters in a wine. There's a premium on that much more quality. So just because you pay more, you could pay more from a famous estate that gets a lot of money each year, but if you buy an off vintage, that's not a great vintage, and you buy another wine that's from a good vintage, but a third of the price, it could be better. So understand that. That is so important to understand. Just because you're paying a lot more doesn't necessarily, you're getting that much more quality or even better than the other wine that's priced more value-wise.